one defining moment, the universe emerged out of nothingness like a bright idea. And so has each one of us, born into this world unique and gifted, a masterpiece cast like never before and never after, a magnificent work of art, and each one of us an artist too, eager to paint the canvas of life. Remember as a child, you woke up each morning full of wonderful ideas and dreams, dreams where everything was possible. You wanted to change the world and you believed that you could, believed in superheroes and believed you could be one. And then it all slowly slipped away. But that does not mean that superheroes do not exist. These heroes stepped out of nothingness into greatness. They were ordinary folks who wanted to make a difference, who believed in their dreams. They were just like you and me, except where everyone else saw the rubble, they saw a palace standing. And when everyone else was enveloped with the darkness of self-doubt, they saw light within. I am Simarjeet Singh, and I believe that the same light flickers in you and in me. I also believe that you have everything you need to reach the pinnacle of your success. And I'm here to tell you that the only person standing between you and your success, between you and your dreams, is you. And it can all change in the moment the voice inside you says, Yes, I can. Yes, I can live with passion and purpose. Yes, I can lead. Yes, I can make a difference. I am the artist and the world is my canvas. I am the superhero I once believed in as a child. And that defining moment is now. Ladies and gentlemen, the year was 2008. I'd just been back to India about five to six months, I believe, after having spent more than a decade in different parts of the world. Some of you might be familiar with that story through other videos that I keep putting on YouTube. And um, the city that I moved back to in India was, is, uh, happened to be Jalandhar, Punjab. Now, uh, this was not the city I was born and raised in. Uh, it, so I did not have a lot of connections here. And after my family moved here due to my dad's uh, sickness, and I left the country for about 10 years. So when I returned back, I ended up in a city which I called home, but I did not have a lot of connections and friends here. However, we did used to go to the gym early in the morning, me and my wife together, uh, what, which was supposedly at that point of time back in 2008, one of the best gyms in the city. And we used to notice this tall, young, very pleasant gentleman every morning who would nod his head and smile, and, uh, but we never exchanged a hello or never had a conversation until one day I was wearing a t-shirt which had the, the logo of my company on it, Cutting Edge Learning Systems, and I had a little tagline underneath which said, Revolutionizing Learning. So this t-shirt is what got him intrigued. He looked at it, he said, so what are you into? And that's where a conversation started. So he was the first one to say hello. A conversation started. He was curious about what I did and how I moved back and what I planned to do, et cetera, et cetera. Cut a long story short, this hello in the gym blossomed into a solid personal and professional friendship over the, which has endured more than 13, 14 years. And it turned out that this pleasant gentleman, tall gentleman in the gym, uh, not only was a regular person in the gym, but also was a voiceover artist and also a very creative person, a radio jockey and an established entrepreneur who would later on be very, very helpful for me to get in touch with other people in the industry, in the city. So I was introduced to people who would who owned a sound studio, who would edit videos for me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, let's start today's interaction by typing this in the chat box. 
I will learn to initiate more conversations. I will learn to initiate more conversations. Indajit Singh Pento, my friend, is the person that I'm referring to. It all started with a hello in the gym and what are you doing? And it blossomed into a solid personal and professional uh, relationship there. And as we begin another episode of the Beginner's Mind series, tell us which part of the world you're logging in from while I introduce you to our guest today who helps you do just that, initiate conversations, overcome your shyness, and build bridges in a world that is busy building walls. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome uh, Susan Rowan. Susan, you are welcome to this interaction. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking out the time uh, for this uh, interaction here today, for this virtual conversation. Um, Susan, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it happens to be the author of the bestseller, uh, which is titled How to, How to Work a Room, which has sold more than 1.2 million copies in 14 different countries across the world. And this book has endured more than three decades, more than 30 years it's been around. And many, a lot of the information has been constantly updated and it's still uh, is really applicable in everything that we do in our lives in order to build and maintain personal and professional networks. Susan has been named by Forbes.com as one of the top 25 networking gurus across the world. She's also the author of uh, Secrets of Savvy Networking, an in-demand international keynote speaker who has shared her message of connection and communication. And I think that's going to be the subject by and large of our conversation today. Um, she shared that message with audiences uh, worldwide. Her clients include companies Companies like Coca-Cola, the U.S. Air Force, United Health Group, Stanford University, LinkedIn, and her personal favorite, Hershey's Chocolate. <laughs> I love that. One of my favorites, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming keynote speaker, best-selling author, entrepreneur, celebrating her 40th anniversary in her own business, the mingling maven, Susan Rowan. Once again, with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Susan, so these are tough times, you know, we have speakers, we're used to, um, you know, meeting people in person and experiencing the thrill of being on stage and the power of, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face connection and all that is missing. I'd like to begin this conversation. Your book has been around more than three decades now, and these are tough times for humanity, for people across the world. You know, we have been forced to retreat back into our little shells and we've, many people are finding themselves isolated. Some of them find it hard to cope with technology. There was a video going viral of a gentleman who by mistake pressed the cat filter on on a Zoom call <laughs> and this video was going, <laughs> yeah. And he didn't know how to turn it off and he was in a court hearing, I believe. So he was yes. trying to convince the judge, I'm not a cat and I'm happy to go ahead with this interaction, <laughs> right? These are tough times. Uh, talk to us about how your book, which has um, been a bestseller for decades, how to work a room, what are the principles which are still relevant today? Well, the number one principle is talk to strangers. It's you went to the gym mm -hmm. and until you, and I want to focus this for the people that are with us today, until you wore something that had a message, what you did by doing that was invite people. What you did is, I'm, I'm okay for you to talk to. After all these years of eyeballing each other and not saying hello, <laughs> you gave him something to talk about. So let's right. underscore that for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give Thanks. people something to talk about. Um, I have a, a shirt that says, give me chocolate and no one will get hurt. And, that, <laughs> and that's, it gives people a smile. Mm -hmm. um, I was once in a bakery, I was wearing my hat that said, um, something about get over it and they didn't have the muffin I liked and I said that why don't you have them today gee I don't understand and he said to me you should read your hat and I <laughs> thought give people something that they can respond to right. um, our secretary a former secretary of state Madeleine Albright always mm. wore pins mm. because as she was dealing with uh, luminaries, foreign luminaries and dignitaries, and they didn't know how to talk to a woman, they would start with commenting on the pin. So mm -hmm. I think when someone gives you something visually, take the offer. And it's so easy. You don't have to make a big conversation. It starts with hello. Right. Indeed. 
Indeed, it starts with, and I love what you said about give people something to start a conversation. Guys, that's a very important uh, key takeaway here. So I'd love for all of you who are watching this conversation live to type that in very quickly in the chat box. Really important takeaway as we begin. Give people something to start that conversation, right? Which is make a statement about your personality. It could be the t-shirt, the message on your t-shirt. It could be something which could, how about weather and small talk? I mean, is that, is that why should busy, super busy people, especially, and I've seen this, you know, uh, having traveled uh, economy class, having traveled business and first class, uh, the higher up you climb and the, you know, these exclusive lounges and the more you move, move into these spaces, we get a little bit, we, we start having second thoughts about making st small talk, you know, with the fear that, oh, probably I might be interrupting that person. He might be doing something important. Uh, is small talk still relevant? Should I be indulging in it? And what are the rules around it? Well, if you don't indulge in small talk, you are saying, I'm, I'm too good for this. I'm too good to get to know about you. Right. Because small talk's the way we find out the little things that connect us to each other. It may be, I'm originally from this town, but I went to school mm -hmm. in this city, and then you find out that person has a cousin who went to that school. Mm -hmm. You know, you miss the serendipity. Right. You miss the little things. You have small talk with someone, and then you might find out uh, that they once played uh, rugby, or they once played mm -hmm. cricket and right. professionally. And yep. that would be so interesting. Small talk is the biggest talk we do. If I know that where I live and I hear it worldwide, well, I want to have significant talk. I want to talk or do a deep dive. Deeper, well, right. I have a different answer to that. Don't mm. tell me you're doing a deep dive into mm. my business and life <laughs> unless you're standing by a pool and going right. to dive in it. <laughs> you, right. One of the things I explicitly say to people you have to earn the right mm -hmm. to ask certain questions. Right. If I don't know you, why are you asking me what keeps me up at night? <laughs> you know, I get that all the time. And I think that conversation is more organic than that. If mm -hmm. you think you have to ask important questions and then you're missing that this person wants to buy an electric car and you can have a conversation about electric cars, right. you're missing the small things that connect us. Um, with the advent of the pro constantly in the media, the introverts who don't like small talk and the introverts who don't like small talk, I, I know many introverts. Mm -hmm. And they are the people who really try to bridge because they know how uncomfortable it is. The real introverts that aren't hiding behind this mm -hmm. designation Mm -hmm. build relationships by finding out about people, feeling comfortable, responding. So if I were you, I would erase this, I don't do small talk, and replace it with, I will connect with you on whatever level so we can find okay. out our common bonds and move forward. Right. right. I, I love that. The uh, a great opportunity to find common ground which is the first step in, you know, initiating any conversation, any relationship worthwhile. I often find having lived in different parts of the world, Susan gives me an opportunity and having traveled so much, which city you come from is it probably a great conversation starter for me. So I'd probably either travel there to do a keynote or I lived in five different countries and experienced those things. There could be something around that to begin that conversation. Um, and I think it's worth repeating what you said. Small talk is the biggest talk that we can indulge in. I love that because uh, this whole thing about, uh, I want to talk about deeper things, none of that is going to happen until you build a bridge. And one of the critical challenges in doing either small talk or saying hello, those are two of the important things we've discussed so far, is um, shyness. Um, so. Tell us these, um, these successful, uh, super successful, savvy networkers, do they have, like, what, is there a different mindset that they're operating with? Are they having different internal conversations? And what can we learn from them? And what should I be? Should I be telling myself something before I log on to that important Zoom call or I walk into that conference room full of 300 people? Talk to us about mindset, please. Okay, here's the mindset. And it sounds a little different than you might expect other people to say, 
The mindset is every time you walk into any room or get on a Zoom call, mm -hmm. remember this. And this is statistically uh, was out of the Stanford Research um, mm -hmm. Shyness Clinic. About 90% of us find walking into a room and to be very daunting because 90% right. of us will say that we are shy in different situations. I mm -hmm. honestly think this that the success of How to Work a Room and its bestseller done worldwide is because people think of themselves as shy. Right. Because people say, oh, I, I, I have to go to this event or I have to be at this conference or I, I don't even like going to my child's school parent meeting mm -hmm. and people want to feel more comfortable. So I think I owe a debt of gratitude to shy people. They bought the book, but I will <laughs> tell you this, if anyone that's with us today thinks, well, I'm a little shy, I would rather be at an event with all shy people mm -hmm. than people who don't think they're shy. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Shy people are never the people that will look over your shoulder to see who more important is in the room. Shy people are not dismissive they will engage because they know how uncomfortable it is. Mm -hmm. So they are some of the best listeners. Right. And I don't know where we are, wherever <clears throat> you are in the world, we do have this in here in this culture where people would try to see who, who should I be talking to that's got a better position, that could do more for me, and they'll look over the shoulder. or mm. Global phenomena, so I'd say. <laughs> Happens okay, across. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it, so, to me, if you're shy and you've worked through it, the people who want to connect with people bring some of their good listening skills and paying attention skills. Uh, in terms of the mindset, and I know this is going to be a little different than other people say, mm -hmm. don't walk into any room with your agenda of what you need to accomplish and who you need to sign on the dotted line. Walk I love into that. every room. Does that resonate with you? Mm -hmm. Indeed, yes. Because when we walk into a room with an agenda, it's as if it's put on our forehead. Oh, right. let's connect with important people. Right. The problem is we often don't know who the important people are who can help us. We assume. I, I've read so many um, comments about be in the right room. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the right room with the right people, that is literally a crock of baloney. Mm -hmm. You don't know who, which is the right room. The right, right room may be the room that has people who don't look to be successful because they don't have to be because they already are. But mm -hmm. it might be the father of the person that can do a client connection with you. Right. It might be someone who has VC money to invest in your venture. Uh -huh. You don't know. So I would say go everywhere to be open to everyone. And the second thing is be nice to every person, regardless of what they're dressed like. Absolutely. The name on their name tag, the mm -hmm. position they have because mm -hmm. you never know. You don't know who they're related to, who they yep. live next door to, mm -hmm. what their story is. Or who they could be in a couple of years time, right? And then you're gonna regret having done that. Um, I often speak, when I speak at universities to do the um, orientation, you know, welcoming students in, um, I often say, you know, don't, don't make this mistake of judging someone from their background, or if they speak with an accent, or they come from a different part of the world, because, this guy could be the next CEO of Google or, you know, or, or Apple or whatever. You don't know. Uh, so I, I like that. And second, you know, the major takeaway from what you just said, and I would want everybody who's listening right now to type that in the comment section, I would network without an agenda. I would walk into a room without an agenda. And I personally feel, Susan, that when you walk uh, into a room full of strangers with an agenda, it's very stressful. And a couple of things happen. A, people can see through it. They know you have an agenda. <laughs> B, as you, right, as you rightly said, you miss so many other opportunities because you've made the assumption of who's important and who's not, and you could be dead wrong at that assumption. 
And um, with the amount of stress it comes with, and you're missing out on so many opportunities, network without an agenda. In fact, I shared this story in one of my videos, how I got my first speaking engagement was networking without an agenda. There's this, there's this guy who had moved back from the United States to India, and he was running a small software company. Friend of mine, I knew him through his dad, so his dad was like a family friend of ours, right? And I did not go to him to seek business, right? I said, let me, he had converted um, a part of his apartment into a small home office, and I just wanted to go and see and check out how he's, how's he, how he has he adapted moving back to India after sp spending so much time abroad and having a chit chat. During that conversation, Susan, they, it came up, he, he just casually asked me, so what, what are your plans? What are you planning to do? And I spoke about a couple of things. I've done executive coaching, leadership programs. I've been to Tony, Tony Robbins Firewalk, blah, blah, blah. And then I said the word motivation somewhere. <laughs> and he was as if he was sitting there, serendipity, as he said, he was sitting there waiting for that one word, which was motivation. And he said, look, I've got a team of like 14, 15 software engineers. And, you know, I feel their work has become a little monotonous lately. Could you do something for them? Do you think you could do something for them? And that was my first speaking engagement. I said yes. I had not walked into his office with an agenda. I love what you said, said about that. So the right mindset, guys, about being a super networker is walk into a room without an agenda. Give everyone the same respect, regardless of their title or their appearance, as you rightly said. And then don't miss out on the small opportunities. You never know how one thing is going to uh, lead to another. One of the root causes, Susan, that I studied while I was, I, I do a lot of research around the subject of people not, of the fear of public speaking, uh, people not being able to present their best selves to the world. And I feel at the root cause is the fear of being judged or scrutinized by others. That is why we have what psychologists now call social anxiety. We feel that they are going to judge us or they're going to scrutinize us and I'm not good enough for, so, so we, we just want to run away from the entire situation. Any tips from a super savvy networker on that? Well, I'm, I'm smiling, but it's really been an issue because now that we're coming out of the pandemic, at least here, and people are beginning to go back into events, there has been a marked increase in the post-pandemic social anxiety. Mm -hmm. People don't even know. And I even had it happen to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in a restaurant. We're outside. When the server comes over, do I put my mask back on when I talk to them? There's mm -hmm. so many things that we don't know. But social anxiety, and I'll go back to the research from Philip Zimbardo, who founded mm -hmm. the Stanford Shyness Clinic, mm -hmm. uh, found that about 80% of us were either shy or we were shy and we worked out of it. But he did say 10% they're not shy, they really have an extreme case of social anxiety. Mm -hmm. But now a lot of us are feeling tidbits of it. Um, you know, we, we really are so excited to see people now. I mean, I California, where I live, we've been locked down. I called it um, house arrest without an ankle bracelet, <laughs> where we were staying in the house. And we're now so happy to see people, but now we don't know. Well, shaking hands is gone. No, right. You know, right. That, mm -hmm. And do what, what do we do? And, and some of um, us are I so think, used to it's like default behavior, you know, so uh, it happened to me too. extend my hand. The other person maybe is, wants to do a fist bump and it's, it's an awkward social interaction. It, it is awkward. But what I find that I'm seeing people do is mm -hmm. They're smiling and laughing about it because we're all <laughs> feeling so awkward. So let's right. go back to what do we have in common with people? We all don't know what the heck to do. So that can even in and of itself start a conversation. I was interviewed by the, I believe it was the New York Magazine or New York Times early in the pandemic. How do we have a conversation that's not about the pandemic? Well, of course I gave them a lot of ideas but I clearly thought about this and I want to make this a point we all get. Worldwide, we have a common conversation and bound. We have all been impacted. We all have stories. We have losses. We've had um, successes where people have come out of it. 
this is a subject that we should embrace and allow ourselves to talk about because mm -hmm. this has impacted the entire world. So don't scoff at it and say, oh, I want to talk about something else. Talk about this. This is the common bond. And what I think is very interesting is a lot of us are adapting what the Eastern form of, of a greeting is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or here's the other one. I was just with a longtime teacher friend of mine who I haven't been able to see in 18 months, a survivor of leukemia and a bone marrow transplant. And I made sure I wore a mask. And I had someone say to me, well, you don't have to. You're double vaccinated. I said, mm -hmm. my friend had two bouts of leukemia right. and a bone marrow transplant. I couldn't in any way think that I was risking her health because nothing is 100%. I wore a mask, but I also have more masks now than I have earrings. So I think <laughs> of them as an accessory. Right. But we were, we finally said, oh my goodness, we can hug each other hello. But it was a different kind of hug. But, you know, we need to get permission for things. Um, the mindset for, I think, the savvy networker is take a cue from the other person. I went, one of my very well-known podcasters who's actually made the cover of Success Magazine, um, I always, I'm like Auntie Susan to their little one. And when his parents come to visit, I always go down to the Silicon Valley and be with them. But I noticed when I saw his parents, they were fist bumpers. And what I had to do is watch and adapt. Mm -hmm. But they were, hello, I can hug you, we're all double vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So I would say this, take a cue. Mm -hmm. Watch what other people are doing. You right. don't want to invade their space. Uh -huh. And it's also now okay to say, would you prefer right because we want to get permission it's like marketing mm -hmm. we want to get permission and we don't want to make someone feel uncomfortable we never did before this we surely don't want to do that now um there was a lot of behavior that went on for many years and probably still do it does of people who assume and have taken too many privileges Mm -hmm. I think it's important to ask, but the mindset is, and this is the Susan Rowan underpinning to everything, mm -hmm. go everywhere to have a good time. Wow. If your mindset is, oh, I'm going to enjoy this, I'm going to have a good time, you will. And then, but if you're the kind of person, like a couple people I know who I <laughs> shall not mention by name, who go everywhere going, oh, I'm not going to have a good time. This is going to be awful. What am I doing here? I could be home, you know, watching Netflix. Uh -huh. If that's your attitude, you will have a right. terrible time. Mm -hmm. And people will see your disgruntled self. That is never the image you want to project. Wow. That is such profound advice I've heard about networking. And I completely agree with it, both from a law of attraction point of view, Susan, and also from a vibrational point of view. I'm, I'm a believer that even before you open your mouth, uh, people can feel maybe something. Approachability is probably, you've probably not uttered a single word, and yet you your presence either makes others comfortable or uncomfortable. And I believe a lot of it has to do with what's going on here, just like what you said. If the conversation is, uh, I'm prob I'm, you know, I should be staying at home watching Netflix, you shouldn't be going out because you are going to have a terrible time and you've, you've created that. Uh, psychologists call it self-fulfilling prophecies. You've just kicked it into action a small self-fulfilling prophecy. You've prophesized you're going to have a horrible time and now you are going to play a major part fulfilling it. Uh, and I love what you said about go everywhere to have a good time, adapt. Uh, this looking for social um, clues and to see what other people are doing and to follow them. I think it's been the golden rule for quite some time in interpersonal behavior, especially in cross-cultural communication. And I think this is something we should be paying attention to, being more sensitive about asking permission, as you said, in terms of meeting and greeting in the post-COVID uh, scenario. Um, using, uh, I attended a seminar sometime back, and I think 
Uh, just type in a yes in the comment section, guys, if this has ever happened to you. You've attended a two-day workshop, and perhaps out of that entire wisdom shared in the two days, just one thing sticks with you, and it sticks with you the rest of your life. And I have this, uh, I think I was working for Marriott Hotels and attended this seminar, and the speaker was talking about speaking people to uh, with their first name, using their first name, is a privilege that they give to you. You do not assume it. And yes. of I've always followed that rule and it's helped me, you know, in different cross-cultural scenarios until somebody would be really irritated and say, oh, do stop calling me Mr. So-and-so, call me by my first name. And when that's absolutely clear, I'd switch to that, right? But before that, it is uh, look for clues and be on. It's, it's just, just like, would you agree with this, uh, Susan? It's just like dressing for an event. You're rather, you're better off, I believe you're better off overdressed than underdressed. Um, well, first of all, what you just said about uh -huh. you use a person's formal title mm. until they invite you. I wrote that in How to Work a Room because I've had people say to me, I wrote that in How to Work a Room in 19, wow. it's in the 1988 the book came out. I was born in 79. Say, <laughs> there we go. So I've had people say to me, what's with California? People come from the East Coast. I'm the boss. Why did they call me Steve? Oh. You you have to give people their honorific. It worked for me because I was raised in Chicago and my mother always said, w whether it's the local policeman on the corner, sergeant, or the military person, the judge, mm -hmm. the doctor, the priest, the rabbi, the nun, right. it's with their formal title. And the same is Mr or we use Ms. more. Some mm -hmm. women still want Mrs. Find that out. Mm -hmm. But you never y use a first name without permission. That's number one. But I'm also going to share something else with the audience. Sure. Don't shorten someone else's name. My name is Susan. Now, I told Simmerjit, I'm four feet 11 inches tall. I know I sound six foot two, <laughs> but I am four feet 11 inches tall. But there are some people who think they should call me Sue. And that's what I want to do to them. I want to sue them for shortening <laughs> my name. That. Right. Don't, if someone's name is Steven, you don't call them Steve unless you hear them introduce themselves that way. Uh, Steve, so right. besides using the title, don't shrink someone else's name. I love that. I saw this little meme going around on Twitter, I believe, which was like with these folks who shorten other, other people's names without their permission. Here's a question for you. What are you going to do with that extra time that you save? <laughs> what is, tell us. We need to we know. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I actually love that they do that. I'd love to see that meme. Send it to me. You know, I think that that's it. And the same thing people say, well, I'm saving a lot of time. I'm not going to do small talk. So mm. let's talk about this. So what's mm. big talk? Cataclysmic things, mm -hmm. wars, famine, pestilence. Politics. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a great way to start a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and leave it up. Don't, don't do that. Maybe right. it's a movie that's out. Maybe it's a team that you support. Maybe uh -huh. it's something funny that happened to you. And here's yep. the other thing. Bring your sense of humor with you everywhere. And right. by the way, I wrote about it and I continued to keep that in the book in every edition it was. Mm -hmm. Humor is never at the expense of anybody else. Agreed. You don't get to make fun of the, sh the short person, the tall person, the person from a different uh, province or state. Mm -hmm. You don't do that, a different religion, a different uh, culture. Because when we do that, we're saying something about ourselves that isn't pleasant. You do not get to make fun of people because someone like me is going to say, really, that's not mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with a brother who had polio back in the day and wore a brace on his leg. And I was once listening to a very prominent speaker at a luncheon tell what he thought was a funny story about someone who had a misshapen hand. And I honestly sat in that luncheon getting a stomachache. Mm -hmm. 
And I realized I had to leave. But I had to leave because I had to make a statement saying, you don't get with two perfect hands to make fun of someone who doesn't have two perfect hands. Right, right. Because I grew up with a brother who had to wear a brace on his legs. So I'm just saying your humor has to be situational. Mm -hmm. It can be on you, but don't tell too many funny things on yourself because then mm -hmm. you don't want people to say, oh, well, that's mm -hmm. a jerk. Why am I listening to that person? Right, right. But there's so much humor out there that it's how you look at things that happen that um, will give you a lighthearted look. And maybe that's the word. Be lighthearted. Wow. Mm -hmm. But that, the number one thing I found in every presentation I give, because I give people, I make people interact, and then we debrief it. The number one thing people say that makes it okay to go over to them, which is why this pandemic has been a problem, is a smile. Mm -hmm. We don't get to see them. So I bought a mask that has plastic here uh -oh. so you could see it. But I did that because I read an article that at one of our grocery stores, they hire hearing impaired people who are used to reading lips, but it was hard for them with the mask. So I bought a mask. So if I'm talking to them, it can help them understand me. Absolutely. Um, and, then, and then I could still wear lipstick, which I always <laughs> thought was a, a positive. Right. And do you see what I just did? Mm-hmm. I told the story and the truth is maybe people go well, I don't care if you're wearing lipstick but I added in a little something personal and then the women listening know yeah that's the problem with masks the lipstick ends up all over our face <laughs> say something a little something because you never know who connects with what aspect mm -hmm. I made a statement about who might be the rugby player or the the movie star you don't know what people will, and I did mention cricket. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because you don't know who knows something and relates to something. So it goes to something that was a song by one of our famous singers, Bonnie Raitt. Let's give them something to talk about, which goes back to the pin, the sweatshirt, the hat. And for men who wear ties, are men ever gonna wear ties again? I don't know. I've had this dress code um, coming in for one of the keynotes, which said, oh, you are ex expected, supposed to wear a tie for that. It's a black tie event. And that's probably the only time I've um, wore a tie in the last um, 13, 12, 13 years. I feel more comfortable. I feel it's more. <laughs> but I've adapted. I still prefer to smart, um, uh, shall I call them smart formals or smart casuals? But I like to wear a jacket and uh, a shirt. And for the for the viewers who might be curious, no, I'm not wearing shorts underneath, um, <laughs> 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 which often is the comfortable thing to do with Zoom calls if you're on Zoom calls all day. But um, no, I feel I feel I went to the Google campus in 2016. I had to. Um, I know you've done a couple of uh, talks yes. at Google yourself. And um, I did this this thing I talked about earlier, this better overdressed and underdressed. And I walked in there with the linen jacket, white shirt and pair of jeans and um, tan shoes. Uh, so which is my usual preferred thing to do. when I'm traveling. Right. But then I found that I was overdressed. Everybody was around me. All the engineers were wearing T-shirts and things like that. So all I needed to do was just take off my jacket and with the shirt, I would still blend in with the crowd and get that. So I didn't want to appear as if, you know, OK, here's because with some of these cultural settings, if you walk in wearing a suit and a tie, um, you probably are uh, instead of making a connection, you probably are going to have a difficult time making a connection because they perceive you in a different way. So I think it's very dynamic, as you rightly said. Uh, all these things are dynamic, situational and your ability your to read the setting, your ability to um, sense the nonverbal uh, clues that are available and to adapt accordingly. That's that's sort of the, the thing to do. You talked about humor and not laughing at somebody else's expense. I'm reminded of an incident, this video that was going viral when President Obama was in charge and he was speaking to, I believe, the top women entrepreneurs in the United States. And he had this podium and this podium had the seal of the president of the United States in front of him and the seal fell off and <laughs> which and both and it fell off. And um, 
an awkward moment of silence there. Everybody's laughing. Uh, so waiting, anticipating how, how, you know, what is, what is he going to do and going to say to recover the situation. And what he said, spontaneity, and I, and I believe when, when you're present, when you're calm, when, when you're not stressed out, you, you are in the moment and a lot of spontaneous things emerge to you. And I love that video because the next thing he said is, that's okay, you know, uh, all of you know who I am. <laughs> and that, that awkward moment got converted into a huge round of applause for him. So, yeah, it does play a huge and, role. And I like what you just said about spontaneity, because we as speakers know that if something happens that we don't acknowledge, there's an elephant in the room. Indeed. And you have to be the one to say that. Right. And I had that happen. I was speaking, and you know the the Hyatt, you know mm -hmm. the Hyatt uh, mm -hmm. franchise. I was speaking at our fancy Hyatt Regency in downtown San Francisco, and I was speaking to a group, and they were interacting. The next thing we know, we hear drills and hammering. Well, they were working on reconstructing a room like two floors away that sounded like it was right in front of us, mm -hmm. and if I didn't think of something to say that would let people know, hey, I hear it. If I had ignored it, I would have been missing the boat. And I said something like, because it was from the room above us, I go, well, I can take a message from the higher authority. <laughs> and the group just cracked up. Right. So, you know, but being spontaneous is important. But, and I want to say there's another piece to being a good communicator, because you said we're going to talk about communicating. Mm -hmm. I was raised in the era of think before you speak. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling there are people that think, but they take too long to think, and you go, all right, say it already. <laughs> but then there are people who are totally unfiltered mm -hmm. and say whatever comes to their mind. Between the two is a balance. You do need to think. Sometimes you want to say something, but I know this is a, I'm a former school teacher. Just because I wanted to say something doesn't mean that whether it was a parent of a child or the class there, that they need to hear it. So you really need to self filter. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that has served me well. Right. Sometimes I've seen, I have said things spontane spontaneously um, in conversation where this old expression comes in. I put my foot in my mouth. Don't want to do it. But let's just say we accidentally say something. Here's how you overcome it. Mm -hmm. You apologize. The right thing to and do. And I know this is going to be, people are saying, well, I thought this is about talking to people. Well, sometimes we need to have in our little quiver of conversation, because I also wrote, what do I say next? And I called it quiver of conversation. We need to be able to honestly and sincerely apologize for something we said or did. And the verbiage isn't, oh, well, if I, I didn't mean for you to be upset. No, no. Mm -hmm. It's, I am so sorry if I upset you right you have to take responsibility Ownership. and i think being mm -hmm. able to apologize if you overstep think before you speak but you must be spontaneous in something with humor like what president obama said and did shows a different level of communication mm -hmm. but be able to think of things and you know what trust yourself mm -hmm. trust yourself because if everyone's feeling uncomfortable that that seal fell off, that's already something you have in common that you can address. Right. right. And you need to acknowledge that. And also the fact that people are looking up to you. Um, you know, you're a leader in that setting. So whether it's a, it's a leading a workshop you know, or leading a keynote session because people are looking up to you or how you're going to handle those situations, but you have a lot in common with them. If something embarrassing has happened, it's, of course it's not your fault, but you have that something in common with them. You can use that as a platform to grow further. Susan, what are your top tips in terms of communicating, especially in social settings, in settings in which people are new to, whether it's at university or somebody just started a new job 
or they're attending a conference where they could potentially walk out with a lot of new connections. What are your top uh, tips for communication in public settings? Communication in public settings is have your own self-introduction in mind. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what you're going to say about yourself, you're already prepared. Right. So here's the Susan Rowan um, self-introduction. It is not a 30-second elevator pitch because no one gets into an elevator to listen to you talk about you for 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, that would be a torturous elevator ride. <laughs> Uh, an introduction is seven to nine seconds, a self-introduction. I, I have been asked, where did you get that it's seven to nine seconds? And I was reading my own book, which mm -hmm. I actually have right here, because there was a research on eye contact, and the gentleman found that after nine seconds, uh, eye contact becomes a glare. So it's seven to nine seconds, and that's the first. The second tip is that you link it to the event you're at. How you introduce yourself at a conference is going to be different than at a friend's daughter's graduation party. And then the third tip is, and I got this from my dear friend, Patricia Fripp, the first woman president of the National Speakers Association and executive speech coach extraordinaire. She once said to me, she calls me by my last name, Rowan, tell people not to give their title. Nobody cares about the title, and the title mm -hmm. varies in importance at different companies. Tell them to give the benefit of what they do. Interesting. And by giving the benefit, so when people say to me, well, what do you do? By the way, I don't ask people what they do. That's not a good conversation starter. People mm. don't like that. Um, I say, I turn people into mingling mavens. Mm. What by doing that, I give someone the opportunity to say, uh, a mingling maven, what does that mean? And then I get to explain. Mm -hmm. A maven is an expert and that I wrote How to Work a Room and I teach people how to mix, mingle, socialize, interact, and communicate. And then once I've been invited to do that, here's what I do, Simmer did. I stop. Because mm -hmm. I could go on and on because I've written, right. you know, eight books. But I stop and then here's the magic words to start the conversation. I turn to the person and say, and what about you? Right. I invite them. So that's the first thing. Have that self-introduction planned. And please, I don't care if you learn the news by reading it on your watch. I used to say that. And then now everyone's reading it on their watch. And I go, well, there goes that line. <laughs> Mm, read too it, much information print. on the wrist. <laughs> right. And then uh, read it online. Read it while we were talking. It's early here in San Francisco. My newspaper man just delivered two print newspapers. So I still read print. I still read digital. Um, I would say be really careful of because of the disinformation of what, what you read online. Do a little deep dive to make sure you're reading and getting evidence rather than just quoting what someone says. Absolutely, um, and sharpening your critical thinking skills in, in the process. When, listen, when I was a teacher, we hired someone literally four decades ago to teach teachers how to teach kids critical thinking. I'm mm -hmm. so glad it's finally come to the business world. But mm -hmm. we really need to assess. But to be ready, have some conversation in your pocket. What would you talk about? What's going on in the world? If you come prepared with a couple of topics, there won't be that pause that, uh, what do we talk about? And here's another thing. When you have an agenda, wh when can I turn it into my agenda? I've been asked this in so many sales uh, keynotes to sales groups. You segue very graciously and very carefully. The, what you want to be is what I call the sultan of segue. I wrote that in my book. You want to change the subject very carefully. Don't interrupt someone in the middle of what they say to get to your agenda. Uh -huh. There are other ways to do it. Right, right. And then, because if you do it and if you, um, dis if this becomes evident that you had an agenda all the way, um, you lose credibility. You lose credibility and I believe 
you lose credibility. And when you interrupt someone to say what you want to say, they remember that you interrupted them mid thought, mid sentence. I've gotten very good at this because now I have a friend who will interrupt and change the subject all the time. And I have now said, excuse me, I was in the middle of a sentence. May I proceed? <laughs> Right. And I do that because he, in fact, I, what I did is I tattletailed on him. I told his wife, I go, he always changes the subject and interrupts. And she said, try being married to him for 50 years. <laughs> no, no comments on that one. But I do, I do use the skill of trying to change the subject when I feel a really low vibration talk is happening. Because, yeah. you know, it's the same way as it works with a Google search or an Amazon search. You search for, like I was searching for your book and your videos yesterday to read up about you and your body of work. And now what's going to happen for the next 15 days is, Susan, you're going to show up everywhere on my social media feed, right? Because that's how the algorithms work. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> now, well, and I believe conversations work the same way. Once you kickstart a conversation with a complaint and somebody else resonates with, oh, look at how bad it is. And then another person comes up with another more compelling example of how bad it is. And that's sort of the moment where I use my skill to gently talk about something else so that we can stop that downhill journey. Because if I remain a party to that conversation, I'll walk away feeling really miserable about the world in general, you know, and this is what happens. Uh, Susan, well, we've been 48 minutes into this conversation and there's been great value add. I really appreciate your time. Before you, before we let you go, icebreakers, he, just, you know, of course, uh, so you've talked about having your self introduction ready. You've talked about having a catchy little description, seven to nine seconds, which captures the essence of what you do and gets people uh, you know, and also giving people enough time to absorb that and come back, involving them in a conversation. Um, but can you share with us from your vast experience some of the top icebreakers we could use to initiate con conversations, whether it's virtual or in person? Uh, you know what? It's what you observe. So what you have in common. If you're actually in a room, it's the room, it's the organization, it's the event, it's the sponsor. I love to talk about food because I think food is what we all are interested in. Mm -hmm. So it might be, has anyone seen the dessert table or did you try this <laughs> dessert or do you know? Have Always you, in demand. Um, the dessert. Yeah, and and it, here's the other thing. This is an icebreaker. You got to this event. Did you hit traffic? We all understand traffic. Did you find parking? Did you take public transportation? And I know you earlier said something about the weather. I listened to someone and it was 20 years ago and I've never forgotten what he said. He was a weatherman on TV and he said, we have one joke in the weather world. It's weather was invented so that people who don't know each other have something to talk <laughs> have about. A conversation. And you may say, oh, well, that's such a small talk. Let me tell you, we had where I live 102 degrees and a lot of there's no air conditioning. Fair people night. were talking about the weather. Mm -hmm. Don't be dismissive of a subject that's happening to people. Uh, we just had a tornado hit part of Chicago, where I'm originally from. I went to my friends and said, are you okay? Did it come to your part of Chicago? Use that as the thing that's in common. If you are in a Zoom and it's pouring rain outside, monsoon rain, tornado rain, whatever, Use that and say, aren't we glad that we're on a Zoom rather than getting drenched? And, you know, use the little things you have in common to kickstart where you are, what you're doing. I, oh, I, I see you're in a room in Zoom and there's a beautiful plant behind you. Now, did you grow that plant? Mm -hmm. You know, you, use your powers of observation yep. and listening. And so that's the icebreakers. There's, you know, I could give you words to say, but then you'll say them and then everyone will say, oh, you must have been listening to Susan Rowan. <laughs> and then they won't like that. So right. I would rather you observe, listen, and you know what? Practice offhand, I was going to say off the cuff, talking mm -hmm. to people. I love going to the supermarket and talking to people I don't know because it gives me practice. Because once you talk to strangers and you say a, a word and then they come back, you are getting better at um, off-the-cuff off the conversation. So mm -hmm. talk everywhere to people. 
And here's the Susan Rowan number one tip. Talk to strangers. Talk to strangers. Maybe not in scary neighborhoods, etc. <laughs> but when you're on a Zoom. Yeah, use your judgment, in guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Talk to strangers. It, I think I am where I am today because I talk to strangers. In fact, one of my dearest friends was sitting next to me in an airport waiting for the same plane that was delayed. And when they gave the reason for the delay, both of us rolled our eyes and said, oh, yeah, right. That's why there's a cop with a police dog here. That was four years ago. We are still dear friends. You don't know mm -hmm. that stranger that you talk to could end up being a friend, a contact, a, a, a lead of someone who will invest in your company. But how about this? Invest in the best of your life as a friend. Wow. I love that. Invest in the best of your life and talk to strangers. I mean, you know, we've heard uh, that this has been conventional wisdom. If you don't talk to strangers, you don't make any new friends. And I think deep down, we all know it, but it's the fear of rejection. And I love, I think it's important that I mention here, one rule that I tried when I used to travel, those were the days. Two things I can talk on for endlessly. One is the indoor plants that you talked about. This one here, yes, I grew it. And all the others around the office got loads of different um, kind of indoor plants and I love them all. And second is about how much I miss travel. And one of these uh, things that I used to do when traveling was I had this rule, talk to one stranger per day. Right now, don't get the opportunity to do that because I'm at home now <laughs> ever since COVID-19 happened and the lockdowns happened. Uh, but yeah, I would make it a point to initiate at least one conversation and not all of them would flow to the next levels. But I ticked off one box off my to do list, which is like I initiated one conversation today. I said hello and I'm reminded of and I would suggest all the viewers to watch this TED talk, TEDx, TEDx talk by Jia Jiang, this young um, Chinese American guy who uh, I think oh, was a I student. Yeah, you've seen that. You, do you know him? Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. Great. And I loved his experiment about rejection, which was and this is what psychology talks about. I was watching the series on Netflix about how the mind works and what they said is the more you put yourself into the situation that you're really scared of, the more insulated you become because it's not that dangerous anymore because your mind is sort of a good assessment of what the real danger is. And I think the same rule applies to people with social anxiety. If you feel it is something that gives you anxiety, put yourself into that situation a bit more rather than retreating into your small shells. And before we let you go, uh, Susan, very important question. Millions of people across the world, I talked about retreating into your shells and millions of people across the world are suffering from, a, from another pandemic, which is loneliness. In fact, Japan and the United Kingdom have ministers of loneliness in their governments to ensure that they can do something about these people and bring the suicide rate down because suicide in Japan and, and the UK is directly connected with loneliness. And I know with several people who might be tuning into this conversation, many of you would be lonely despite having so many connections on LinkedIn or Facebook, etc. What words of inspiration would you offer them as we close this beautiful conversation? And it, it's true because our Surgeon General wrote the book together, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and it was based on people thought that the epidemic would have been other physical things, and he found that it was a international, it was loneliness. So I would say this, we can't, even if we're in our homes, pick up the phone, mm -hmm. the actual phone that you can call people, call the people you know. It, we keep on thinking it has to be Zoom, it's gotta be FaceTime, it's gotta be WhatsApp. I mean, I've loved it. I've had WhatsApp conversation in Paris. I've had WhatsApp conversations in Tel Aviv, in the UK. Talk to the people that are already in your life. Be, and this is what, and I'm gonna have to close with this, be what uh, Sir Richard Branson quoted about me that I said, good things come not to those who wait, good things come to those who initiate. I love that. So be the initiator. Invite, if you want, invite five people, invite your cousins to Zoom. Be the person that says, yes, I'm not gonna wait for people to come to me. 
I will initiate. And I figured if Richard Branson put me on his list of the top 10, that that starting anything, extend yourself. And loneliness is a terrible problem in suicide and depression. And we're going to have a we're going to have a generation of children in the schools that we need to pay attention to because they have not been with their pals. Right. Initiate. Smile. I had someone yesterday say something and I was wearing a mask and I said, oh, my God, that's so funny. I really loved it. I wish you could see my smile. And she (laughs) said, I can. It's in your eye. Right. Fantastic. I so love I hope that. that helps. It does if indeed. If anyone has a question that comes up, here's this is the old teacher in me. If you have a question for me, Susan at SusanRowan.com. I'm sure it'll be in the notes. Feel free to send me an email with a question and we will solve it together. Fantastic. Susan, thank you so much for your time. And time just flew by. I didn't even realize. I think we've overshot, and I appreciate you taking out the time for this conversation. You look after yourself, and thank you once again. And you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. you a virtual hug, Susan. <laughs> virtual hug. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care. Namaste. Bye-bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Susan Rowan from San Francisco, California. She's the author, as I already uh, shared with you all, of How to Work a Room, this book that has sold millions of copies and has endured for several decades. Um, I love what she said in the end, towards the end, initiate. Initiate, Initiative is leadership, I believe, uh, for all of those who are watching right now. Any act of taking initiative is an act of leadership, and self-leadership is the first and the foremost and the most important form of leadership there is ever out there. Before you seek to lead others, learn to lead yourself. If you must take initiative as a leader of other people, you must also take the initiative of leading yourself, leading, initiating conversations so that you don't end up in loneliness, so that you expand your horizons and um, get to learn from all wonderful people around you. I'll finish today's live session with this uh, little poem by Emily Dickinson. If I can stop one heart from breaking, that's the title. If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. I shall not live in vain. Times are tough for people across the world. The world is going through a very difficult time. Uh, Let's reach out. Let's reach out and connect with someone and make a difference in someone's life. As Emily Dickinson said, if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. Thank you for tuning in today. Bye-bye now. 